Hello, hello. Hopefully you can see and hear just fine. I hope all of you are well. Once I'm sure everything's up and running, I will do a proper introduction, but it's great to see all of you. Welcome to Bach to Basics. Been waiting for this day for a long time. So, I hope you're all doing great. And if you are watching from the Bach to Basics course on summerbach.com, congratulations, you're in the, in the very best place to be. And if you're joining me uh, from Facebook or YouTube, then I want to encourage you to get to the best place to be. Um, because in order to download your materials and join the whole community that's there, you need to go to www.summerbach.com and just do a quick register for the course. It's free. Bach to Basics is free. Then you can download your materials. We've got an awesome welcome packet, journal, of course, the music, clean and marked copies for this wonderful Bach E major preludio, which is our goal for the week. Now, I would love to, awesome, I see the chat. And I'm not seeing 500 people say they can't see or hear me, so, <laughs> wonderful. Well, let's get, Sorry, I, I can't resist. Let's get back to basics. Um, let's get started. And the first thing I'd like to do is make sure the instrument sounds as good as it can, make sure the settings are good. At least the, the audio settings. I can't do much about the settings of my hands and, and the violin. Um, right, refresh your browser. Um, if you have intermittent issues, that almost always solves it. Um, take a look, if you would, at the journal, if you've downloaded the journal. If you haven't, that's right here in Monday, day one of Bach to Basics as well. We're all going to have different goals, right, with this piece, this great piece by Bach, depending on where we're coming from. Uh, depending on what kind of week we have lined up for ourselves. We don't all have uh, all week to devote simply to solo Bach. I wish I did. Those would all be great weeks. Um, but it's going to depend, right, on whether you've played this piece before, whether you've played solo Bach before. And I do encourage everyone who's taking part to aim for some kind of a, a video recording that you do over the weekend. That is standard procedure for a lot of you, I know. It sounds terrifying for some of you, and that's okay. But what it does is it, it just puts a capper on your work. It gives you something to aim for, and the really fun part is it gives you something to look back on after the fact to say, wow, look at what I did in just one week or just five days of focused, dedicated work on this. I promise you, you're going to go further than you thought you could. And that video just has a way, um, it concentrates the mind, it concentrates your efforts, and it's not meant to be something that you release to the whole world, or it certainly doesn't have to be. You can, if you're proud, you want to share some of your work. You can also share some of your work process. If you like making videos during the week, that's a great thing to do. But I do encourage you to start your week setting that intention of putting something down recorded during the weekend. And we're going to adapt challenges all throughout this week, especially by modifying tempo um, and difficulty in other ways. So you're in the right place as long as you're here with an open mind. 
So when you look at that journal, and I've got it pulled up here, you know, the first, um, don't neglect the date, by the way, fill in the date. Um, you'd be surprised at how quickly you can forget what happens day to day. And the top section is all about intentions, what you're intending to do, what you hope to accomplish that day. And that doesn't have to be results, like I intend to play this whole piece in tune and in tempo by the end of the day. Yeah, it's a little hard to predict. It's more what you're going to work on, how you're going to work. So the way I've laid it out for you, I've given you assignments to do. And so your intentions could simply be, you know, to follow the assignments. It's great to write the titles of the assignments on there. One on the board, for example, and going on from there. Um, and you got a space to mark how much time you have available to practice during the day, because that's going to vary from person to person and from day to day. And when you see it on there, it's a lot easier to plan your day, right? If I know that I only have 20 or 30 minutes in a day, and I can write that right up top, then when I set my intentions, I can feel really good about, you know, I'm going to work on page one or page two of this piece, and I'm going to touch on this spot in page five, and I'm going to work on it with these, these few techniques. And then I can feel good about that. If I am not realistic about my time and I put down all these intentions and then I don't get to half of them, I'm going to end the day feeling bad, like I didn't accomplish something. So, so much of it is about your intentions, your expectations. The journal, um, by the way, if you're missing it, um, it can be downloaded. It's the B2B journal and it's linked in this, right in the same topic here, where hopefully you're watching this video, it's Monday of Bach to Basics. Um, the sheet music is there too, which I'll, of course I'll be referring to in the assignments. So, actions come next. You've set your intentions. Actions is simply what you did. And, you know, most of the time that's going to match up, right? Actions should include also an approximate amount of time that you spent. So if you said my, you know, I've got 40 minutes to work on this today. My intentions are the six assignments or so that, that Nathan recommended. Um, actions. Yes, I did all six assignments. Um, here's how long each of them took. And it could be as simple as that. Let's say you don't get to all of it. So you simply write down what you did because at the bottom, there's a recap. This is more of a big picture what did you feel like your wins were? What were some of the frustrations? And what is left to do tomorrow? Now, in this case, you're not necessarily going to know what the assignments are for tomorrow, but you can still write a recap. And especially if you didn't get to one of the assignments and you really wanted to, you can put that at the recap. Let me add that to tomorrow's work if I've got time. It's going to seem strange at first and you might even resent taking the bow off the string and going to write something down, but trust me, it's so worth it. It builds in little mental breaks for you. It makes your practice so much more purposeful. And we all know that practice with a purpose is five times more effective than just grinding away and you know trying to play better. I'm not about trying. Um, great. Let's take a look at Monday, Monday's assignments as well. If you've been part of the Violympics before, um, if you've worked with me in some way, you know I love to solve one problem at a time when I can. This Preludio combines a number of challenges, right? And so sometimes we have to work on a couple things at once, but as much as possible, I love breaking this down into the fundamental skills. That was the whole idea this week. So that if you've worked on these before, here's your chance to refine them, do them in a slightly different way. If you haven't, then you're adding new skills to your bag very quickly without the distraction of, you know, everything else that might go along with it in a piece. So this very first assignment, one on the board, 
That just means that whenever possible, you have your first finger on the string, on A string, or at least resting right there. And the reason is that the consistency and the strength of your hand frame, which I define as that relationship between one and four, a perfect octave. It's the basis for so much of what we do on the violin, right? If I'm going to play a little scale, a little one octave E major scale, those are all the perfect intervals, right? We've got that octave, but we've also got that A has to match my open A string. Perfect fourth, perfect fifth. So if I always know where my one and four should be relative to each other, whatever position I'm in, whatever strings I'm on, then I've got a really solid and great hand frame. The next part of having a great hand frame is not allowing it to be disturbed just because I have to move my fingers around. So, within this, I don't have to disturb my one and my four just to change the shapes of my two and my three. Now in first position, especially if you're not used to that, that may not be the most comfortable thing in the world. So don't worry about it if it's not totally comfortable yet. It's something you get used to, particularly if you've got your hand set up so that four is relatively comfortable. If you see your hand and it looks like this, you could play a one and a four in tune, but look how I'm stretching up for that four. My hand is down low, my four is stretching up. Nothing I'm gonna do now is gonna be comfortable. So I want my hand a little higher, closer to me, closer to the bridge, and to reach back with the one instead. That's a more normal hand position. And, and it's gonna allow me to maneuver a lot better. So this is all background. It's the why, as far as why, to have your one resting on the string. So don't worry about perfecting or understanding all of that yet, unless you're terribly curious about it. Bottom line is, if you know where your one is, then over time that will tell you where your four goes as well, and by extension, those other fingers. So, I do most of my playing with my first finger at least resting on the string. The exceptions are the open strings, there are going to be a lot of those in this preludio, and any notes that require a particularly free vibrato. I, I always get asked about that. That's not really going to come up in this piece, but if I'm starting the, the Barber Violin Concerto and I really want that first note to have a free and a wide vibrato, probably I'm not going to have my one resting on the string. I mean, I could, but it puts kind of a natural break on the vibrato to have other fingers down, so I might lift up in that case. In this preludio, generally that one's going to be on the string unless it's an open string. So for now, we're going to play bars three through eight. You're going to lift your one only when you have an open string. And then the second part of that is to replace it as quickly as you can where it's going next. Okay, so bars three through eight. You know what, I'm going to turn my iPad the other way. Got those older eyes now. So, easy enough so far, yeah? Here, when you put down the four, here's a place where 
Many of you might be tempted to lift up your one. But then you'd have to put it back down again. It's much more consistent. I've lifted it. I want to get it down on that D string again as quickly as I can. Now this is part of another assignment later in the week, not to spoil it too much, but to make it much easier to leave my one in one place, I'm actually covering two strings. I'm covering the D and the A strings on violin, G and D on viola, the two middle strings. So... So when I put my three down, I'm also putting down my two and my one, you can see. Through bar eight. Interesting note here, right? I can't exactly put my one down any earlier than I am, right? Because we're ascending. So in that case, it has to go down last minute. It has to go down right when it's needed. But I've left it down for all that. And because I left it down after the shift, it's already right where it needs to be. This is one of the most important concepts and assignments. And if all you get out of the entire Bach to Basics week is to leave your one down, it will have been worth it for you. It's going to change your playing forever. Now, if you notice that your hand whether that's actually the first finger or more likely whether it's kind of your thumb or your palm is getting tense because you're you, now now that you've gone from not ever having your one on the string to you're really pressing it in there all the time you're going to be the happy medium right it doesn't have to press down all the way it certainly shouldn't push down any more than necessary it could just be resting on the string not even push down all the way but it's just that you know where it is that it's always there for you. Let's go to our next assignment. Frame job. That's all about the hand frame. So aren't, uh, aren't I glad I gave that extensive background before. Um, we're looking at bar seven. So those first three beats, they're ascending patterns. And uh, no surprise, since it's a scale type thing, we're using first, second, and third fingers. So, so rather than saying, okay, well, I've got a um, E and then an F sharp and a G sharp, let's look at finger patterns. So. In the first and second beats, my fingers look like this, right? I've got a big spaces in between one and two and two and three, whole step spaces. So on the third beat, so that takes care of in the third beat, it's going to look like this. We've got a whole step in between one and two. Two and three are joined together. I like um, I like rather extreme differences, like either fingers are apart or they're together. Um, we can, there, there are going to be times when, you know, you finesse that a little bit, of course, but if you've never thought in terms of which fingers are separated and which are really joined at the hip, that's going to improve your intonation immensely, particularly in fast playing, because it's going to allow you to let the fingers work in groups and not to have to place them individually. 
So in the welcome packet, if you worked through those prep exercises, and by the way, if you've sort of arrived here just in time and you didn't get a chance to look at the welcome packet, um, you can do that or not bother with it this time, but it has some more background info for you and it has some even more fundamental and preparatory exercises that you can do to whip yourself into shape for this week. So take a look at that if you haven't yet, because in there we looked at easy lifts and drops. That truly was about letting the fingers work together. So for right now, we're gonna drop fingers one, two, and three onto the D string or the G string for viola with the proper spacing. So that means, okay, they're all going up in the air. They're all coming back down, up in the air, back down. So we do this because you may find some of you that you have a habit of whenever two lifts, it shrinks right back to one and squeezes next to one. Whenever three lifts, it comes right next to two. When I play, that may happen some of the time, particularly if I'm right, again, using a free vibrato, really opening up the hand like this. But if it's a lot of passage work like it is in this piece, then when I lift fingers, I want them to lift right over where they were. So if I've got space on the fingerboard, I want that to exist when it's in the air too. So after I've done that a few times, I'm gonna lift them all up and move them all over one string. Same pattern, right? Because we decided. So D string, A string, going back and forth between the two middle strings. And now when I go onto my top string, that pattern's gonna change, right? Now, not all the fingers have to change their shape. Only one, yeah? And that's the third finger. So three, when I say change shape, what do I mean? If you look at the angle that your knuckle makes in this light, you can see it so well. Um, here, the three is separated from the two. You could call it a high three, because it is. <laughs> if I now move only the three back next to the two, what's happened to that knuckle? Now it forms almost a right angle. Here was the high three, low three, high three, low three. Only that three is moving, the rest of the hand undisturbed. So that's what I mean when I say change shape. I'm not just kind of picking it up and moving it closer, but keeping the same shape, because now I've cramped my hand. Do you notice, by the way, I didn't put this in the packet, but do you notice, <laughs> by the way, I don't play with my four under the fingerboard. I'm just trying to get it out of the way so you can see the other fingers. <laughs> Even though my two and my three, the fingertips are touching now, There's space here in between at what I call the base knuckles, right? So I can stick a finger in there even though... Yep. I, here I'm closing that space, tension in the hand. Here I'm opening it up. That's a nice little exercise you can do. Put fingertips together and practice opening and closing that space. Here I'll do it with just fingers one and two. Generally easiest there. Fingertips are touching, but I'm opening up the space. Two and three, finally three and four. So, move it up a string. When I move it over to the top string, three changes shape and joins with two. All right. And what we've done is we framed the hand for each of those first three beats because when I play the bar, I really only want to think of three drops. And by lessening the time I spend on the long note, I can play the bar much, much faster than necessary, even though I'm really only dropping three things. So if I go back one bar now, um, to bar six, let's play from the second note of bar six through the first note of bar seven. Let me just refresh my memory now. 
I should, that would have been a good challenge for me this week, memorize the bar numbers of this piece. That's what we're dealing with, all right. So the patterns of the first two beats are the same that we've been dealing with. We're just adding a fourth finger, right? So one, two, and three are still separated by whole steps. Four joins with three. So if I lift that, here's what it looks like, right? Now I'm going to put all four fingers on the string with that spacing and then lift them all at once. Replace them again. Lift them again. The way when I lift, this is why we do video and don't rely on the text for everything. When I lift, I'd rather not lift like this, right, with my fingers pointing up to the ceiling. I'd rather lift so that those pads are still pointing back down at the string so they're ready for action. See how much further away the fingers are now as compared to here. So. Let me move them down a string now. D string for violin, G for viola. Still that spacing. I noticed that my two started creeping up to the three, so I'm moving my two back again without disturbing that frame. We've just framed bar six, because when I play it, I want to drop all my fingers onto this string, then lift them one by one. Excellent. So that is the frame job, and right, you will have there. There's hardly a bar of music here in this preludio, or indeed music that you'll play the rest of your life that doesn't doesn't give you the chance to think about this and to frame them. So I, I call out specifically 55 to 56 and 113 to 127. If you want to try those, let's just look at what those bars are: 55 to 56. 3 And the pattern changes a little bit, but in other words, if every time I lift one of those fingers, it lifts right above where it was, so much the better. I have a lot less work to do to replace it. So let's go to our next assignment. I will tell you this, I, I put slightly more assignments toward the beginning of the week. So Monday has more assignments, They're, they deal with less musical material. I wanted to introduce some concepts and we'll just work on little spots with them. So not every day we'll have quite the same number of assignments. Next is a fun one, uh, two string bariolage. Um, I have a stand partner where every time we have <laughs> A bariolage pattern like that. I can count on count on them to write the name bariolage. You know the the friendly friendly Irish string crossing specialist that uh, haunts many of our pieces. Um, you got to make your own fun in orchestra sometimes, but that just means anything where you're alternating between between two strings for effect. It's especially useful if one of the strings doesn't change. Maybe it's an open string. That's been used ever since Baroque times. That was a favorite technique if you think, I mean, in the Four Seasons it's all over there, right? And a million other examples. Um, one string stays the same. Maybe it's open, maybe it's stopped. 
but it's a it's an effect that never goes out of style and Bach uses it expertly here even though it seems like it's a bow thing because it is I'd love for us to prepare our left hand first and then we'll deal with the bow aspect later because that's not actually all that complicated um, let's look at bars 13 through 16 in this preludio and it's one open string one stop string with mo moving notes um, I mentioned bar 3 has the same kind of thing it's gonna be the same concept because what's happening what's happening is I keep pressing the wrong thing to get back to my music it's these bars so the idea that may be new to some of you is that the left hand gets to move early yeah because we've got that time while we're bowing the other string namely in this case the top string we've got time to go ahead and move our left hand to the next note now why would we want to do that um, wouldn't we want to just synchronize everything and have it happen exactly um, there are a couple reasons not to do that if we can avoid it uh, if you try to place it exactly then there's only one moment where it's going to be right yeah <laughs> and that's the exact right moment <laughs> if you're a little bit late then it, it's going to sound terrible um, but you've got all the time in the world early so why not take advantage of it and then you can just move the left hand a little bit more easily so what I'd love for you to do is to exaggerate that as soon as I've crossed over I'm going to lift up that four I've lifted the two, put down the two, so when it's a little faster, gosh that's hard to do slowly, I should do this more often. Now I'm going to play it in tempo and you'll see that my left hand appears to be moving in slow motion and that's because it has all the time in the world you know another reason that it looks like it's moving slowly is because it's not moving very far <laughs> I don't lift my fingers very far I lift them quickly but not too far off the string so that is um, one of the best sections to start practicing that uh, don't worry about the bow just yet but I'll give you a hint the bow arm is going to stay talked about this in the welcome packet but it's one of those double stop string levels I talked about having seven string levels seven arm levels on the instrument we've got the four strings right top so on the violin it's E, A, D, G but then in addition I've got in between the bottom two strings in between here in between here it's great practice by the way to just practice rocking your arm and you do this in different parts of the bow by the way you can start in the middle close your eyes see if you can tell just by the way the bow feels when you're on one string resting on two strings back to just a single string resting on two single two and single I was 
less than 100% exact there. There's one, <laughs> one Bach movement where it's crucial that you understand that feeling. It's the slow movement of the A minor sonata. By the way, it has to start very soft on two strings. The quieter it is, the harder it is, because if you're going to play it loud, you can just really mash the bow there. You're definitely going to play two strings. When it's quiet, you got to get that balance just right. Many's the time that I've started that. Get over. <laughs> so getting a feel for those double stop string levels, that is where the arm will remain for this. While we're here, might as well tune that. And then the hand will take me, or sorry, the it's a combination of the hand, the, this part of the arm, will take me between those two strings. So arm stays here. All right, sneak preview of a Bariolage bow assignment. Um, this whole thing about the f left hand moving early, earlier than the notes need to sound. Um, Galamian put it really well when he called it the difference between technical timing and musical timing. You know, I don't love necessarily everything that Galamian says or how he explained it, but he got a lot of things right. <laughs> and this is a great concept to carry forward. What you do physically doesn't always match and shouldn't always match what comes out of the instrument or what your listeners hear. So the technical timing is you're moving your fingers early. The musical timing is the notes sound just where they need to be. And as a side effect, it's very easy. All right. Next assignment, short comes from long. And that is simply the concept that all the bow strokes, whether they're on the string or off the string, have at their core, have as their foundation, the simple back and forth on the string connected detaché. Okay, so... All the other strokes come from that. With apologies to... Mr. Suzuki, whose, whose books I play, I played all of them. I went all the way through all 10 books with my first wonderful teacher, Donna Weehy. Um, and then moved on to another teacher and, and started exploring much more of the repertoire. So with apologies to Mr. Suzuki, uh, in the early parts of Suzuki, you spend a lot of time doing this. And kind of growing out of that are these longer strokes that connect more. Um, and that's backward. Yeah, because this is the crucial fundamental skill. And then everything else comes from that. Because you can decide how much of the bow you're using. Is it going to be... Is it going to be only part of the bow? Is it going to be faster bow? Is it going to be faster bow with a little space in between? But at no point am I stopping the bow on the string. That's just, it's anti-musical, or I should say at least anti-vocal. And most of the great music we play is in some way vocal. Maybe only Bobby McFerrin could sing this preludio, but the techniques we're going to use to play these notes, even the fast ones, come from vocal techniques. So I say not only is that anti-vocal, but it physically it doesn't feel good, does it? So if I need to put a stop between notes I'm simply going to let the bow come to a stop. If the stop 
needs to be even longer than that. Then I'm gonna let the bow release from the string. I'd rather do that than because then I don't get any ring. And if you recognize that rhythm, beginning of the piece. So, to the assignment, short comes from long. I'm gonna play a long bow on any open string, from frog to tip, moderate bow speed. I'm calling it two seconds at 60. Let me get my handy metronome app here. I promise I'm not uh, messaging anyone. So, here's 60. If I say two seconds per bow, I want to pick a speed where the bow feels like it can, can sink in at this middle contact point. I often refer to the contact points, one being right next to the bridge, five being almost exactly at the fingerboard, three right in the middle, and then, you know, two and four filling in the gaps. Five contact points, I take that from Simon Fisher's wonderful book, Tone, and, and his other writings as well. So I want it to feel as though the bow could sink in at that three contact point. So two clicks for each bow. So at the middle click, I should just about be passing the middle of the bow and should be making a, a lot of sound. If that feels fast, that may feel like a fast bow to many of you. That's a good thing because you've got lots of room to open up your sound. To me, that feels like a normal bow speed, normal solo bow speed. Um, so if that feels fast to you, start getting used to it and start getting used to it at that contact point. I've met many players who wish they made more sound and they're always playing out here at a four or even a five. But to do that bow speed here at a three, it's great, I can feel some resistance. And if I want to get even better at this, I'm going to notice if my contact point drifts. Because if it does, oh geez, why was that going out there? Well, it's because the bow's crooked. Best reason for a straight bow is not just to look great in pictures. It's that when your bow is straight, you have a much better chance of keeping a consistent contact point. So if I see that it's drifted out, it's because I was bowing this way around my body. That feeling, by the way, is gonna change string to string. On the, on the top string, I'm probably less likely to be bowing around my body. But on the top string, it's very common. So, yeah, depending on where I'm facing the camera, that might not look straight at all, but that is straight. Great. So now that I've done that, I'm gonna turn off the metronome uh, because that was just to help me set that bow speed. So one more reminder. That's about the speed. Now, I'm going to subtract a couple inches from the bow. Same bow speed, but it's going to be a shorter bow because I'm not going to use either end. Because of that, I'm not going to be matching up with the metronome anymore, so that's why I've turned it off. But I'm going to keep about that same bow speed. Right? I'm going to keep subtracting inches, so now it's only going to be from here to here. Same bow speed though, so the bow's going to change more often. I'm going to keep subtracting until I'm only using a few inches in the middle of the bow. Um, now it stands to reason, if I'm going from the, this quarter mark to that quarter mark, how much of the bow am I using? 
exactly half the bow, right? It's the middle half, if that makes any sense. So if I've done that right, half the amount of bow, same speed, I should be changing twice as often. So I should only be needing one click to go from the quarter mark to the quarter mark. Great. If I divided it further, then the speed I'd be changing. If I used the quarter of the bow, I'd need only half a click. I'd uh, do two bows per click, right? So keep subtracting until I've reached a working tempo for the preludio. What do I mean by working tempo? I mean the kind of tempo where you can play sections of this piece already. So if you can read through at least some of the piece like yeah. then that's your working tempo so i'm going to keep subtracting bow until i'm changing bow about that often so I do that boy I feel a real connection to the string a real concentration that's very different from kind of slapping at each individual note this that's really in the string and that's how I play even when it's fast not a lot of effort there's just a focus to it right At the end of this, I'll play the piece through, and that, that can serve as an example of a live one-shot deal for us. Um, the final note I put on this assignment is important. Resist the temptation to help your fingers with the bow. What I mean by that is, you know, if a finger wants to be slow, the bow wants to, you know, help out maybe by either setting the tempo resist that temptation let the bow follow the fingers this right hand following the left deal talked about in the welcome packet i believe and that's an important concept to to playing easy and steadily um next is bowing choices that's not a lot of legwork that you have to do but it's to look at the marked part that i gave and to notice the slurs that I marked. I didn't take away any of Bach's slurs, but I did add some. And those of you who have played this piece before will know why that is. Um, it's simply harder to alternate strings when the upper string is on a down bow. So you can try this for yourself. But if I'm between the two top strings, for example, and I play down bow on the top string. If I try to do that fast, I can do it because I've had to do it different times in my life, but it is much easier with the up bow on the top string. And the reason is that in that case, The shape that my hand is tracing is like a circle, or maybe it's an oval, but in any case, it's circular. The other way... It ends up a little more of a figure eight, and it's just most people have a pretty strong feeling that that just feels wrong. Um, so you don't have to take those bowing changes that I put in. I think if you've never played this piece before, they're a great idea and I do suggest them. Uh, but you can always play the print, so to speak. You'll see that my markings are in red and you can disregard them. Um, next, coordination right follows left. Uh, introduce this 
just a bit ago. Um, here we get to look at that a little further. And I do mean that. Um, many of us were taught, you know, that the, you know, the right hand determines bow changes, basically. So the right hand sets the tempo, sets the speed, and the left hand has to fit in there. I've generally found it easier and prefer to teach that the left hand, let's get the left hand even. Let's get the left hand changing notes exactly when we want. And then ask the bow to follow. Partly I like that because as you already saw, so much of the time we're preparing fingers in advance anyway, so the bow is going to come actually after the left hand. Other times, well, sometimes it's going to come a lot after the left hand. Other times it's going to come right after the left hand. And of course, much of the time, it'll be exactly with the left hand. I still prefer to think that the right hand is following at the last possible moment. So, minimizing that little extra note there. So the right hand is the last possible moment. Um, so pick any section that you can play without stressing about the notes. Uh, I was just at bar six and that's a great place um, to try this out. So instead of playing separates, we're going to slur as many notes as we can in one bow. You can change bows as necessary. Slur as much as you can though, because that makes it easier to hear the evenness. If that shift is stressing you out right now, don't worry about it yet. You don't have to play that far. Uh, for those who are shifting, make sure that your evenness extends through that shift. So if you're noticing that you're having to wait for that shift, just notice that for now. And as you repeat it over and over, Shift early enough that your first finger arrives in time. Now, if it does not sound even, I can use different techniques to try to even it out. So-called dotted rhythms, which I call note grouping. Or I can simply notice huh. that open A is late. I guess that's, I guess my arm isn't getting over soon enough. Let me make it too early and see what that sounds like. Just right. Once I'm satisfied, why was I doing that in separate bows? I should have been slurring that. Once I'm satisfied that the slurred rhythm is even, then I can ask the right hand to follow by playing separate bows, which I just did. Um, next, structural elements. And I put this on the first day very deliberately because so much of the time, and I include myself in this, if I've got a bunch of notes to learn uh, to get a piece ready, what do I do? Set myself to learning the notes, um, do a whole bunch of work, a lot of stress, and then, okay, it's all learned. It's all, everything's in its place. Now I can sprinkle in some musical shape. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> the piece will resist it. I've done all this prep work. <laughs> yeah. To try to change that takes so much effort to put shape in there, to, to pretend I'm gonna get inspired in the moment and shape it. I'm going to be going against all the work that I've done so far. So I want to identify the structural elements that will help me make shaping decisions right here on the first day. So th this is something that um, works well in text form, so I don't have to go over all of that on video, but I mentioned a few different kinds of elements. Repetition, right?
I know it's there on the page, the forte, the piano, but it's worth just playing it once forte, playing it once piano, and to know, hey, when I learn two bars, I've also learned the next two bars. That's an echo effect, right? It's not just 24 16th notes in a row. Wait, 48 16th notes in a row, but it's a group of two bars and then an echo of two bars. Um, 9 and 10 and 11 and 12, 13, 14, 15 and 16. This is this game in the beginning. These shorter elements and then longer ones, the, the so-called famous spot, right? Series. And we're going to get more into that later in the week. But anytime you've got a pattern and then the whole thing repeats, maybe down a step or down a fifth or up a step, um, you've got some decisions to make. So it's great to start marking those, like here's a series of elements, and I know I've got to make some decision about it. I don't have to set it in stone right now, but I can tell this is going to be something that I need to grow in or taper off. <clears throat> so I ask you to find a way to mark them, brackets, other creative pictures, anything you like. <gasps> and finally, uh, the last assignment, um, and you can use this technique all week, I just want you to get your feet wet with it today. Um, expanding your mind, I call it. What it really is, is a combination of um, learning the notes and memorizing at the same time. It's very effective and very simple, so uh, we'll go to bar, well, 125, second beat is where I have us beginning. Doesn't get easier than that, does it? And so expanding forward. By the way, I'm doing this at my working tempo, perhaps even a little faster. If I can, I'm going to be aiming for whatever I think my performance tempo might be at the end of the week. Now let me expand backward, play the first beat alone. I want to get my three down early. Now expand forward a beat again, first beat of 126. Expand backward, last beat of 124. And if any point that kind of breaks down and it doesn't feel good, like maybe I expand one too many times and it breaks down in the middle, I contract again, polish up the thing that doesn't feel good, and then go ahead and uh, expand a little more. Uh, if I hit a plateau, I just leave it for the time being, but I mark, here's a section that I expanded. All right, let me play this thing, and well, if my pedals will cooperate, that is, there they go. I might have it memorized, but then again, why fall on my face, even if it's in front of a sympathetic audience like you find folks. All right.
stays always stays exciting especially with the live audience and to anyone watching later too <laughs> you can pretend you were there for the moment um, well thanks so much for joining me for day one of five it's only the first day of the week and by the weekend you will be further along than you imagine and you will have tried a whole bunch of new things and uh, I hope gotten a better understanding of your violin viola body and violin viola mind. So please come back tomorrow, whether you're watching live, whether you caught it after the fact. It's this whole week, 2 p.m. Pacific time. Um, so tomorrow's session will be in the Tuesday topic. And again, if you're catching this not on the summerbach.com website, I urge you to go there right away and get registered. It's free. Download the materials, join the fun. There's a great community there already. You guys have been awesome filling in your profiles and starting discussions. It's going to be super fun. So can't wait to see you tomorrow. All the best to you. And for the rest of the week, Bach to Basics. See you.